you know what time it is. Football season, Q4. Time to close out another year of growth and prep for the next year of revenue. To bring in more businesses Q4 and beyond, you need HubSpot Sales Hub. With a smart prospecting workspace, deal management suite, and AI-powered apps, you can take total control of your operation to generate more leads and land more sales. And when you pair a sales hub with other hubs in HubSpot Smart CRM, your team will be on the same page across the entire customer journey. Leads won't slip through the cracks, and data is connected across marketing, sales, and operations, so you can better measure your impact on the bottom line. Stop sticking to the same old strategies and start closing more deals, because the best time to score is Q4. Make the switch to HubSpot Sales Hub at HubSpot.com slash sales. Howdy, folks. Hope you're doing well. It's Monday, February 13th. This was actually recorded before the Super Bowl, but I sure hope the Kansas City Chiefs won. I'm Jacob Cohen. I just sat down from tossing some chicken wings into the oven actually before the big game. Rob Letters is with me later today for our main conversation, and you are listening to The Hustle Daily Show. All right, today we're talking about the rideshare wars. On Friday, Lyft stock had its worst day since the company went public four years ago. Meanwhile, Uber, which has over time expanded into other verticals that now dwarf Lyft's entire business, was in the green. What's the state of the rideshare wars in 2023? We will discuss. But first, let's take a look at what else is going on in the world of business and tech. Let's get crackleck. All right, first things first, we've got some big news out of the dog food industry. Post Holdings will acquire several pet food brands, including Nine Lives and Kibbles and Bits. That's a good one from JM Smucker Co. For $1.2 billion, the pet food industry has just exploded over the years with revenue forecast to reach almost $58 billion this year, up from $22 billion in 2014, according to Food Dive. Moving along, some news out of Adidas. The company said it could lose around $1.3 billion if it can't sell its Yeezy branded merch, causing an 11% drop in its stock price last week. Adidas ended its partnership with Ye after some of his anti-Semitic comments. Also, the Wall Street Journal found that in 2022, sales of the Ivy Park brand, which is Beyonce's streetwear partnership with Adidas, dropped 50% to around $40 $40 million, well below internal projections of $250 million. This year, Adidas was targeting apparently $335 million in sales for that brand, and it's on track to hit just $65 million. So still a lot, but clearly not what they originally hoped. Okay, what's next? According to CNBC, Google employees took to the company's internal forum meme gen this week with critical feedback of the company's rushed, botched, ungoogly, and comically short-sighted announcement of its chat GPT AI competitor Bard last week. Those were some of the words that these employees used. The underwhelming announcement, which failed to really just live up to the hype around it, pushed Alphabet stock down more than 9%. We'll see how that plays out this week. And in other news, China's TikTok parent ByteDance is carving out market share in the VR headset space. Last year, Meta held 90% of the market, but according to the Wall Street Journal, by the third quarter of 2022, that was down to 75%, and ByteDance's Pico held 15% of that market. Also, Amazon's exploring an acquisition of MX Player, one of the largest on-demand video streaming services in India, as it looks to broaden its investments in entertainment overseas, according to TechCrunch. Also, a report found that more than 50% of Twitter's top 1,000 advertisers had stopped spending in January, including Coca-Cola, Wells Fargo, and Jeep. Ad revenue from Twitter's top 1,000 subscribers has shrunk 65% in three months, according to data collected by CNN. And that's as the company looks to diversify revenue with paid subscriptions. And finally, this week, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey is hitting 1,500 screens in the United States. That movie was able to come into existence after the Winnie the Pooh intellectual property entered the public domain. And in Mexico, where the film was released on January 29th, the film has made more than a million dollars at the box office off of what it called a very, very tight sub $100,000 budget. All right, and with that, let's talk rideshare. All right, JC. So last week, Uber and Lyft reported earnings. You might think that these companies would be performing similarly year over year, since for a long time, that kind of seemed to be the case. I think Uber 
had a little more market share, but generally speaking, they were kind of tracking each other. But while Uber stock was in the green, Lyft saw its worst day of trading in its four year history down around 36% on Friday. What the heck happened here? What's going on at Lyft? Yes, yes. Lyft uh, actually reported a beat on revenue and growth for the fourth quarter. But what people did not like to see was uh, they expect some reverse growth this quarter. It also had fewer riders last quarter than it did in the same quarter of 2019 pre-pandemic, while Uber saw uh, their user base grow 18% in the period. So Wall Street didn't like this news. A bunch of firms downgraded the stock. Lyft's CFO pointed to things like seasonality and having to run lower prices to explain the guidance. But Lyft went public in March 2019 at $72 a share, $24 billion valuation. Today, it's at something like a $3.7 billion valuation. Wow. Okay, so that's lit, but what about Uber? Yeah, so Uber, on the other hand, reported what it called its strongest quarter ever. Bookings grew 19% year over year to more than $30 billion. Revenue grew 49% year over year to $8.6 billion. They're heading toward profitability. They expect further growth this quarter. Uh, and by the way, though, while the stock has certainly outperformed Lyft, it's only grown uh, something like 17% since going public. So not insane growth, but the company has the scale. It's focused on efficiency. It's poised for more growth. That's really interesting. I think so when you kind of look at tech holistically and the kind of venture capital Silicon Valley model, I feel like the mantra that everybody reports back to is that kind of like, move fast, break things. And now they're putting the right levers in place, I think, to bring on new riders and Uber Eats is doing great. So it's, right. Um, yeah. And so it's kind of been fun to watch them grow up over time. It feels to me, I was thinking about this, it feels almost like one of those coming of age movies where two kids grow up together and then they kind of go out to college, different places. They get into their early 30s. One is really successful, is starting a big family. The other is kind of like struggling and <laughs> trying to figure out where they where they belong, what they want to do. Because uh, back in the day, the conversation was really just Uber or Lyft, pink or black. But uh, that's because these were really just ride hailing companies then. And today, if you're looking at Uber, it's so much more than that. And that was really one of the main points that was pushed to the surface in these earnings, that Uber has just emerged out of the, out of the pandemic in a much better, much more diversified position than Lyft. Yeah. Besides the obvious perks of expanding their products, which are obviously like driving revenue and stuff like that, I think another really big advantage to offering things like food delivery and some of the other things that Uber is doing is retention. Uh, so if you're using Uber for more than just ride sharing, then all of a sudden Uber has this pricing power, right? Because if it's just apples to apples and it's Uber versus Lyft and all you're looking at them for is hailing rides, then you're going to go with whoever's cheaper. But if you're looking at Uber for whatever else, you know, food delivery and, and anything else that you might be looking at there, then all of a sudden they have a little bit of pricing power. They can pay their drivers better, increase mm -hmm. their advantage as far as scale goes. And it starts to look pretty scary for Lyft. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah. And I think the question is kind of what happens now for Lyft, because it, it just seems more and more that Uber is just pulling away in this space. And, you know, some people think a sale is necessary. Others think potentially a merger with, with a DoorDash could make sense Ooh. and help them compete. But even so, I just think the 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 flywheel that Uber has going, that brand, and uh, the growth it's seeing, the efficiency it's working into its business. I just see it being really hard to com compete with them. And uh, this is what a lot of people think is really just a, a winner-take-all industry. So yeah, the more they pull away, I just think the harder it's going to get to compete. Totally. Who do you think could acquire Lyft? Because I, I have an idea, but I mean, I feel like we're 
a broken record with this because we always talk about the same company. I, I'm pretty sure we <laughs> talked <think> about <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bezos. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That they come in this year and buy Snap and Lyft. That, that would be crazy. But <laughs> honestly, like with their delivery and with everything that they're doing around logistics, I don't know. I feel like there could be a play there. And you know, I actually think that the antitrust overlords might be interested in that because it would increase competition in this yeah, space. that's a good point. Uh, whereas if things are just continuing to go as they're going, Uber will probably be the only person in this, the only the only player in this space. So that's an, it could be an interesting one. And, and Lyft is looking pretty cheap right now. <laughs> yeah. And bada bing, bada boom. That's going to do it for us today. Thanks for tuning in to the Hustle Daily Show. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Ezra Trupiano. Our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, you can go sign up at thehustle.co slash email. Hope you have an awesome start to the week. Great Monday. Let's get it. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, I want to tell you about another podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. This one is called My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Puri. My First Million features famous guests like Alex Hermosi, Sophia Amoruso, and Hassan Minaj sharing their secrets for how they made their first million and how to apply their learnings to capitalize on today's business trends and opportunities. So for example, in a recent episode, Sean discusses how his former intern, went from making $30,000 a year to $40,000 in one minute by taking one big bet. And today, he's a 22-year-old millionaire, thanks to a couple early investments. Want to know more? You can listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts. 